Okay, so we stopped my last lecture talking about uh, the tantalizing uh, slogan that uh, entanglement builds space-time. So I'm going to spend the last lecture talking about quantities related to entanglement. So in, in holography, and um, so holographic entanglement, and in particular, the quantity, a quantity that measures amount of entanglement is the entanglement entropy. Okay, how many of you have, have heard of entanglement entropy? Okay, great. <laughs> so, so just as a very brief reminder or, reminder or quick thing for those of you who haven't, if you have a Hilbert space, that factorizes into some Hilbert space pertaining to some subsystem I'll call A, um, with the rest, let's, let me call the rest B, then the density matrix, if you have a density matrix uh, in the full system, you can define the reduced density matrix pertaining to a subsystem by tracing over the rest of it uh, of the full density matrix. And then you can characterize the amount of mixedness of this reduced density matrix in terms of its von Neumann entropy, which is called the entanglement entropy for that subsystem, which is just minus the trace of this reduced density matrix log rho A. Okay, so that's a formal definition. It's a quantity that is sensitive to the microscopics, to the sort of amount of entanglement. So if you wanted to compute it in some you know, strongly coupled CFT, this is a very difficult thing to do. It's a very intricate quantity to define. And what we'll see is that in the holographic context, miraculously, it has a very simple description. So the first um, proposal um, was Oops, okay. Was the Ryu Takanagi RT uh, um, correspondence proposal for how do you how do you uh, characterize this in the context when you have a CFT? Well, first of all, they consider just the configurations which are static. And then you can, you can work at constant time and never care about what happens uh, in as time evolves because it's always the same because it's just static. So this will be just one snapshot in time and there will be a description in terms of a spatial, spatial slice. And the subsystem that's very natural to identify in a local quantum field theory is a spatial subregion. So you can say, well, we have some, maybe we don't know the physics in everywhere, but we, we know it in this room because we see inside this room and we don't see anything else. Those are closed, so we trace over the outside and we just talk about the inside. So we specify a, a subregion of our space, so spatially, co-dimension zero, subregion, okay, our room. And that will be our system A. And so now we want to describe what is, how, how mixed are we with the rest of it, if we were on the living in the CFT. So in the CFT, um, well, if I have just the, the Poincare sort of patch where this is the boundary at z equal to zero, and I specify a subsystem, so let me specify, let's say my region A, our room here, it's just this part of it. Okay, so this will be A. Um, if I draw the global picture, um, okay, we would be living in some region like this. Or if I want to draw it in higher dimensions, so this was just like one spatial direction, but okay, we have three spatial directions in this room. So our region A would be some specification would be the, something like this. Um, okay, so there's a proposal. So these are all the same pictures. I'm just giving you different 
uh, perspective. So the, uh, the proposal says that, and this is now well proved and tested and all that, um, that the entanglement entropy of the reduced density matrix uh, pertaining to the subsystem, when you trace out the whole rest of it, is given by holographically by the area in, in quarter of the area in Planck units, okay, so 4G Newton, area of a certain surface in the bulk, let me call it gamma sub A, saying that it pertains to a, um, the region A, well, okay, let me, let me actually do it. Let's say gamma, gamma will be a um, surface which is um, going to be anchored on the boundary of A here, let's say something like this, such that its area is minimized out of all possible surfaces gamma, which are homologous to this region A. So let me, let me sort of explain this part. Okay, so this is a homology condition. Okay, so um, a surface being homologous to A means that there exists some region, let me call it R sub A, such that the only boundaries of that region are given by that surface and the original region. So in particular, that implies that the boundary of, of the surface gamma is the same as the boundary of my region. This is something known as the entangling surface. Is this too small? No, oh, it's fine. Okay, okay. Okay, so out of all the surfaces that are anchored on this entangling surface, um, so you can take any, anything like this. What you cannot take is something that doesn't end here or having gonna, you know, some, some, some um, you know, pieces that end somewhere else. Um, out of all such surfaces, you want to take the globally minimal, sorry, the globally minimal one, the, the one that has the smallest area. Now, why don't I just draw this? Well, this is a surface in the bulk. Net at the boundary, there's, you know, any finite coordinate distance is really infinite proper distance. So, so that doesn't help because that would be, that's too large. In fact, a surface like this has to come perpendicularly uh, to the boundary because the areas are infinite here. It wants to minimize the time that it spends in the large area region, so it needs to go into the bulk perpendicularly. But then if it went too far, that would be unnecessarily too far. It, it, it's, so there's some uh, sweet spot in between. And we have already seen what that looks like for uh, the geodesics. They were just semicircles, right? So if you have a three-dimensional um, space, space-time, uh, then, um, OK, so the boundary, let's, let, let me. Uh, let me sort out the dimensions here. We, let's say we're in ADSD plus one. The boundary is d-dimensional. Uh, so that means the space on which the spatial slice of the boundary is d minus one dimensional. The dangling surface is d minus two dimensional, but this gamma an anchored on it is, again, d minus one dimensional. So in the full bulk space time, this would be co-dimension two uh, surface. So in ADS3, that would be one-dimensional surface, namely a curve, and that happens to be a geodesic. So we have drawn these geodesics already. In higher dimensions, it's not a geodesic, but, but, but a correspondingly co-dimension two surface. Okay, so out of all such surfaces, we're finding the globally minimal one at constant time slice. Such a thing exists because we were just working in Riemannian geometry. And the proposal, so here, so the minimal one, okay, if this was really, Pure ADS, um, then this would look, you know, something like this. 
And here it looks something like this. Again, in three dimensions, that's just our geodesic. Here it's the, you know, the higher dimensional like a dome. Um, and uh, it, so that, that's, that's a surface. And its proper area uh, in quarter Planck units gives you the entanglement entropy. Now, of course, because the surface goes up to infinity, that area, that proper area diverges. You might think that's a bug. Well, in some sense, it is a bug, but it's also a feature because the divergence is made precisely by the CFT, because there you have a UV divergence associated with modes of arbitrarily, you know, in arbitrarily in the UV being entangled across this entangling surface. Okay, so you have a similar, you have the same uh, UV divergence of the associated with the entanglement entropy as you mock up by having this surface go up to the boundary. So it's okay, we don't, we don't worry about the fact that the area is infinite. It's still a well-defined notion of a minimal surface because you just set it to be the one whose area variation uh, is, is, is zero when you vary it. Okay, um, okay so that's, that's, the, that's the picture when you have a static configuration. And I should say, it's quite remarkable that, first of all, entanglement entropy was a complicated object. And second of all, the holographic map is very intricate and complicated. So you might have thought that the holographic dual of the entanglement entropy is something doubly complicated. But, you know, a minimal surface is just about the simplest thing that you, can, you might think of being associated with this region. You want something geometrical uh, that's sort of sensitive to how big this region is. And this is, if you had no guess what, so I mean, no idea what sort of a quantity it was, and I told you, give me something natural in the bulk that's associated with this region, well, you might have guessed this uh, minimal surface. So it's quite tantalizing that that simplest possible type of thing is actually computing for us, its area is computing for us this entanglement entropy. Okay, so that, that was sort of a first hint that, okay, there's something interesting here. And once you have this, this uh, uh, description or pro prescription of how to compute entanglement entropy, you can then say, well, does this recasting of it, this holographic version, tell us something new, or at least give us a different insight for how the entanglement structure behaves? And indeed, that was immediately after Ryo Takainagi wrote this paper, very, very shortly after that, it was um, uh, realized by uh, Hedrick and Takainagi that, for example, you can use it to prove this. Um, prove these uh, properties like strong subadditivity. So let me just show it because it's one liner and it's very cute. So, so strong subadditivity is a relation between uh, entanglement entropies of multiple subsystems. So suppose you have, so here is my, my boundary and let me draw two regions. Um, well, secretly it's really three regions, but let me phrase it in the original way. There's a region A, but I'll have an overlapping region B. Okay, here's my overlapping region B. So really I have, I can define A, I can define B, I can define A intersection B and A union B. And for each of those subsystems, okay, there's some spatial regions on the boundary, I can define an entanglement entropy. Those are independent quantities because these are independent regions, but there's a relation between them or not a relation as an equation, but there's an inequality. The inequality says that the entanglement entropy of A plus the entanglement entropy of B cannot be any smaller than the entanglement entropy of the intersection of them plus the entanglement entropy of the union. And in terms of the quantum information content, all that really says is that well, something called the mutual information, which is the total amount of correlation between two regions, 
has to be monotonic in the region size, which makes complete sense because if you have, you know, you have two subsystems that are correlated, certain amount of correlation, if you add to one of those subsystems, well, that amount of correlation cannot go down. It can only increase. That's the statement of strong subadditivity. So it's a universal relation that works for any quantum system. And uh, the, the, the proof in the quantum information context in the completely general case was actually fairly involved. It's a theorem, but the proof was quite substantial. Now let's see in the restricted context of holography, how does this come about from this prescription? Okay, and we'll see it comes about very simply. So let's just draw the pictures here. So we have entanglement entropy of A is given by the area of the surface. Entanglement entropy of B is given by the area of this surface. So this uh, left-hand side is computed by the sum of these two areas. But I can write the sum of these two areas as an area that's, well, I can take this surface, you know, I can cut it at the intersection and take this combined surface, and I can add to it the area of this combined surface. Okay, I haven't done anything. I have just re repartitioned these terms and added up the, them in different order. But uh, this surface is certainly by construction larger than the minimal surface in its homology class. Minimal surface that's anchored on this full region that happens to be the A union B. So if I, so this would be the minimal surface for a union B, but my cut-up area was anchored at the same place, but was not the minimal surface, and therefore its area cannot be any smaller than the minimal surface because the minimal surface is the one with the smallest area. Okay, that, that's all I'm using. I'm just using this definition. Okay, so then similarly for this surface, the minimal surface for um, a intersection B is, has to have smaller area than, the, than any other surface in that homology class. And so that means that this side, which was given by, let me, let me work in the units where uh, uh, 4G Newton is 1, <laughs> so I don't have to keep writing that, so it's just in the quarter plank uh, area units, I would have area of gamma A plus area of gamma B, that's just equal. This is greater or equal to then area of, well, it's equal to the area of this surface, which itself is greater than area of the gamma A union B, and plus the area of this surface, which is greater than the other one, A intersection B. Sorry, gamma A intersection B. Okay, so there you go, and that's this side. So that was easy, and you can actually extend this to, you know, argue for further uh, another inequality, which is even more intriguing, which is called monogamy of mutual information, which doesn't pertain to arbitrary quantum states, but just, well, it, it can be proved in holography by exactly the same, same type of procedure. And so there, um, you know, we have, a, we have a relation or some hint about the entanglement structure of any state that can be describing a classical bulk geometry uh, by saying, well, such a set of entanglement entropies must be restricted to be able to obey all these uh, types of relations, including things like MMI, which are not uh, obeyed by generic quantum states, but are obeyed by these holographic states. Okay, so that's, um, let's see what else I want to say about the static context. My battery is running out, so after a while I will. <laughs> um, this will die on me. Um, all right. 
Oh, one more thing I wanted to say was the, this homology condition. Um, it can be quite non-trivial. So for example, if you, have, if you have a context where you have a black hole, um, so for black ho state of black hole, well, maybe the easiest type of picture is this Poincaré disk one. If you have a black hole in the bulk, a global ideas, that's the boundary, and then there's a black hole. Um, in, so if we, okay, there might be better picture on, in terms of the Penrose diagram, what I'm doing is I'm just taking, um, I'm taking a slice at zero time. Um, and so I'm, and I'm looking, now I'm re reintroducing in the angle, so I look down, I come to the horizon, but there is nothing inside the horizon because this would have re-expanded. So if I drew the embedding diagram, another picture of the same thing, this would have flared out. Um, and the horizon, okay, let's, let's have some color coding. The horizon um, bifurcation point here would be this thing going around the neck like this, the neck of this einstein rosen bridge. Now, if I take the region to be actually the entire CFT space, then uh, you might say, well, there is no entangling surface, so what am I doing? There shouldn't be any, any, any surface to, for this to be anchored on. So why doesn't the, so maybe the entanglement of the full state vanishes. And indeed, it would have for pure ADS. If you take the full space, there's nothing else. The state is a pure state, and the entanglement entropy of that pure state vanishes. But if you have a black hole, it's like having the thermophile double that we ended last lecture with. If you trace out half of it, it's now a thermal state. It does have entanglement. And in fact, here we see that in order to satisfy this homology condition, our region, so our region is like this full thing here, that's our region A. And if you take this R, so by the way, here the R of A was just the, the region in between here. So same thing happens here. If you had R going all the way through the space time, it would not satisfy this condition because part of its boundary would have been this other boundary which we're not mentioning. And so it actually has to end. There is a non-trivial surface gamma, and the minimum of such non-trivial surface is precisely, well, minimum of such surface is precisely the event horizon. And so this is telling us that the entanglement entropy for the full boundary is precisely given by the black hole entropy, the thermodynamic black hole entropy uh, for the Schwarzschild ADS black hole. So this was a microscopic quantity. This is a macroscopic thermal quantity, but the, those two things coincide in this case. Of course, you can take smaller regions. You don't have to see the full ADS. And then this homology condition does very interesting things. There's a phase transition when the minimal uh, that's sort of generated by this minimality where one family of surfaces exchanges dominance with another family of which becomes the smaller area and you have a sort of a nice saturation of entropy as you sort of change the region size. But that's too much of a tangent, so let me not go uh, there, but uh, feel free to ask questions after that, after you know, the talks. So that's what I want to say about the static case. Now I want to talk about the generic time-dependent situation. So, but before I go there, let me see if anyone has any questions on what I have said. Yeah. Oh, you can ask and I can repeat. Perfect. Yeah, thanks. Uh, can you explain about the, well, since you were explaining about the structure of entanglement in this holographic uh, uh, setup, uh, can you explain also about the, uh, Entropy cons that uh, you have studied. <laughs> I could. I could spend hours explaining that. But, <laughs> but least, let uh, me let me let me mm -hmm. postpone that to ah. see whether there is time because I think that is less of an applied GR. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a beautiful story, but it's I want to get to the sort of more GR part 
for the theme of the school, but I'll be totally happy to talk about it afterwards with, with okay, any of the, the basic idea is because all the, well, if you describe multiple subsystems and you describe independent entropies for all of them, then you can use this sort of bulk description to motivate what should be all the relations, what should be restrictions between the relations, and then you can use this to, to um, nail down properties of the entanglement structure that would represent uh, the geometric states in, in holographic CFTs. So the goal of that, the overall vision of that is to get more insight about the emergence of space-time. And there is indeed the crucial part of that story, or the crucial trick there, is this minimality condition and working with a discrete set of surfaces. Okay, so that, that's, that's quite a nice um, toolkit. Okay, but yeah, let me for now leave it at, at that, and then, then we can come back to it offline. Okay, other questions? Good. Um, okay, so let's, let's, let's think about the time-dependent case. In time-dependent case, you can no longer, so here we said we're working at constant time. But what is constant time when you have time dependence? Well, you can't say t equal to zero or something because you have no geometric notion of t. You can specify a Cauchy slice, space like Cauchy slice, that's good, but there are many other ones that are just as good. Okay, whereas in static space times, there is a geometrical definition. Okay, we, we, we glibly talk about t equal to zero, but that t has a meaning. Uh, you can specify that t is the orbit of the killing field. The killing field is a geometrical construct, and then you can find a hypersurface at the constant t and so forth. So everything we have done secretly was geometrical, even though we have formulated it in this co putatively coordinate dependent way. But we can't do that. Uh, in any context, we have secretly done a geometrical thing, so now we have to do a geometrical thing, uh, but we have to figure out where that, well, what is the prescription? So there, um, so that was one problem. The other problem is that, oops, is, wait. Oh, I see, this is the second one. <laughs> Sorry. Um, is that there is no notion of a minimal surface because you can decrease an area arbitrarily by wiggling the surface in, a, in the time-like direction, by like making it piecewise null, you can make its area being zero. Okay, so there is no longer, we, if you don't have just Riemannian geometry, there is no minimum for the area. Okay, so then what do we do? Well, it turns out, so we, we propose this. Um, so this is me, Rangamani, and Takayadagi. Um, shortly after their paper, uh, which was the sort of covariantization of this. And the covariantization ends up being very simple. You replace, well, now you, you're working in the full space time. You don't, you don't restrict to any slice. But you have, you, 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 Minimize the area over surfaces which are just extremal surfaces. So extremal surface is one where um, if you take the area, again, it's infinite, but if you vary the area, uh, the, the, the variation of that area uh, vanishes. It's also one, if you have some surface in the space-time, uh, which has, so if I define the exp null expansion from a given surface, okay, so this is this, you write this as theta, the outgoing and the ingoing null expansions from an extremal surface, well, okay, in flat space, the circle is not an extremal surface, the ball would not be extremal surface, a plane would be. Uh, it, what you want is that both for the outgoing and the ingoing expansions have to vanish. Well, in any directions, the expansions have to vanish. The, the, the trace of the um, extrinsic curvature has to vanish. Okay, so, um, so that's another way of defining it. And now the, the 
prescription for calculating the entanglement entropy is still the same, so that's great. Uh, but now these surfaces don't have to span, if, even when, if they're anchored and dangling surfaces all lie at the same boundary time, it's no longer true that the corresponding bulk extremal surfaces span just the spatial slice of that bulk. So let me try, try to draw this. Uh, I'm not very good. Um, you let me move this up. So if you have, so suppose we have some constant time on the boundary. On the boundary, boundary metric is just Einstein static universe. It's static. You can, it's a geometrical meaning to saying t equal to zero on the boundary. Okay, that, that's fine. But now, so now we take a bunch of regions. Let's say we take a region, um, it's, it's almost dead. <laughs> we take a region A, let's say, like this. We take another region. Um, well, okay, let me draw one from the other side so that um, B like this. I can have the extremal surface for A lie at some time and extremal surface for B lie at another time. Well, okay, this is, okay, let me go it this way, such that there's a time-like separation uh, between some points on it. Not between the whole thing, of course, because the, they're anchored at space-like separated points, but they can, they can, okay, in the 3D bulk, they can do something like this, where this would be the time direction. Okay, so, the set of all extremal surfaces anchored at a single boundary time actually spans some codimension zero bulk region. This is the first hint, but sorry, this is definitely not the first hint, but this is one of the hints, um, and okay, one of the early ones, that you can't try to construct the duality time by time, snapshot by snapshot. The bulk space-time really maps non-trivially to the boundary in the sense that you need a chunk of it to describe what's happening at a single time slice. Maybe the most natural chunk of it would be something like a, what in certain subset of the community became known as the Wheeler-David patch. You can just take a, you know, the um, future domain of dependence, well, plus the past domain of, well, the full domain of dependence in the bulk if you don't use the boundary conditions of your, of the, or any Cauchy slice ending on this slice or something. But, okay, you, you don't expect to go beyond that, but certainly you don't expect to localize on a single, single Cauchy slice to describe, for example, the geometry that would be needed to tell you what are all the entanglement entropies at this single time. Okay, but that's not a problem. That's an observation. Um, now, uh, from this standpoint, um, you, you, you might say, well, okay, that's a disaster for these types of proofs because that, that proof of the strong subjectivity relied on the minimality and relied on the fact that we could cut and rejoin the surfaces because they intersected. If we have this situation, the surfaces no longer intersect, so there is no natural place to cut and rejoin them. So, in fact, the proof of, as I say, in the dynamical situation was much more involved, but also very nice. So this was due to Aaron Wall, who rephrased this prescription as a maximin, maximin uh, construction. And what that one does, is to say, okay, you have a, so you want to define again, entanglement entropy of, just let me say, what is it for a single region, and then we'll utilize it to prove SSA. Um, um, okay, let's see what else I will say after this, just to, okay. Um, because this will die. <laughs> um, so, so um, so to, to define the entanglement entropy, you take, your, you take your entangling surface, okay, let me draw A from this side, you take your entangling surface, and you consider any, 
but let's consider a Cauchy slice that contains, well, let's consider it one that contains the region A. In, in the end, all that really matters is the entangling surface, or rather the domain of dependence of A, rather than where A is lo located on the boundary. But okay, but we take one that sort of contains A, and that Cauchy surface describes, has an induced metric that's Riemannian, okay, it's a, it's a space-like surface, and on that Riemannian co-dimension one surface, we can certainly find a globally minimal surface, okay, that's not an extremal surface, that's just a globally minimal on this, on this specific Cauchy slice, uh, but it exists, and now we can vary over all possible Cauchy slices that contain A, and the maximum area that we can get for these globally minimal surfaces computes for us the entanglement entropy. So if I were to write this as, the, as, as a formula, you maximize, at the end of the day, you maximize over all Cauchy slices, but what you're maximizing is still the globally minimal surface that's homologous to A, um, and you're, again, minimizing the area of it um, um, in, in these Planck units, quarter Planck units. Okay, so that's the maximum prescription. And because you're maximizing sort of in one direction and minimizing in another direction, it's not surprising to, to realize that that's the same as the extremal surface, but it's much more subtle than, I mean, lot, <laughs> lots of machinery goes into proving that. Okay, so most of the Aaron Walls paper was in that. Once you have that prescription and prove that the maximum surface is indeed equivalent to the uh, extremal surface, then the SSA proof is not so much harder. So what you do, actually the hardest thing about it is trying to draw it. <laughs> what, you, what you do is that, so let me, let me take... Let me put the A and B both on this side, and let me make them small enough in the global ADS such that I can just draw part of the boundary that now will look flat rather than wrapped around as a cylinder. Okay, so now I'm drawing part of the boundary, and I'm going to have, at constant spatial slice, I'm going to have this region A, I'm going to have this region B, okay, at the same it's supposed meant to be sort of at the same time. And I have my extremal surfaces. So there is one, um, let me call it gamma B. There is the other one, which might be at some point time like separated from this. So those two definitely don't lie on the same Cauchy slice. What does lie on the same Cauchy slice, and that was a non trivial, again, non trivial part of Aaron's of Aaron Wall's proof is the, is the A intersection B and the A union B extremal surfaces because those are space-like separated. Okay, it's clear that they lie on a common Cauchy slice, but what's more, they lie on a common so-called maximum slice on which they're both individually the globally minimal surface in that homology class. Okay, that's a... Okay. That's a mouthful, but okay, there is a, there is a obliging surface sigma, ah. sigma which contains, which contains both uh, the A union B and the A intersection B extremal surfaces, but not these two. Okay, so we can't yet do our cut and paste procedure, but what we can do is we can take a null congruence from uh, from these extremal surfaces up to, up to our sigma. Okay, now this is the part that's very hard to draw because now it looks, they look like they're all on it. So imagine that this was, imagine this is sigma, here is my gamma A, and now I'm taking null congruence up to sigma. And I'll intersect that null congruence with, um, with, uh, with sigma. So I, I have another surface, let me call it dashed, dashed surface, the dashed surface, let's say gamma B tilde, and similarly gamma A tilde, will be once 
where so gamma b tilde is the null congruence from b intersected with sigma, um, and similarly for gamma a tilde. And now we're in business because we have projected everything onto this single surface sigma, and we have we have so s of a plus s of b, which was the areas of uh, gamma a plus area of gamma b. Um, we have gamma area of gamma a is something, but now you take a null congruence from an extremal surface. That means its expansion is uh, non-positive. And so area, as you go along that null congruence, shrinks. So by the time it hits this, I think I didn't attempt to draw this, this slide sheet, this null congruence, by the time that hits sigma, it has smaller area. So that means this is greater or equal to the area of gamma A tilde plus the other one, gamma B tilde. And those, and now we apply the same, now we're all on the same surface in this Riemannian geometry, and we can use the previous argument up there to say that this is greater than the areas of the intersection and union um, uh, extremal surfaces. And we're done, because this is, this is indeed um, the um, right-hand side of the SSA. OK, that was just to illustrate the technique, the power, the sort of um, Use of GR, what we used was extremal surface having uh, non-negative expansions, right Schroeder's equation. So this requires null energy condition. That's an extra, that's an assumption about the space time where this HRT prescription or equivalently this maximum prescription makes sense. If you don't satisfy null energy condition, you can find situations which would have putatively violated that. But I would say, well, that wasn't the right situation to start with because that, that, that situation, that space time was not physical one. Okay. And by the way, there's generalizations of this to the quantum, so-called quantum extremal surface and so forth, which again, I'm not going to uh, go off into that tangent because there's one more thing I want to do, uh, tell you. So I'll stick to classical GR, but there is a nice story uh, that has had lots of recent attention so-called island formula and information paradox and so forth that you can ask me about later again. Okay, so in the last, I guess, 15 minutes, um, let me uh, play a game <laughs> of asking, okay, so we're, we, we have defined one quantity, well, not defined, well, I mean, we have talked about one quantity that corresponded to this region A namely the entanglement entropy of the region A. Let's now ask um, if one has full control over the physics, CFT physics inside the region A, so say we describe the full you know, reduced density matrix in this room, this, this room being our region A, then what about the bulk, what part of the bulk is, are we describing? After all, so the full bulk is described by the full CFT. Oops. Almost there. Okay. Okay, good enough. <laughs> the full bulk is described by the full CFT. Now, suppose we ignore part of the CFT. We say we have access only to a subsystem. Is there still a sensible space-time region in the bulk that corresponds to our restriction, our, our, our selection of a subsystem on the boundary. Okay, so this is something that goes under the name of sort of the dual of the density matrix. Uh, so first observation on the boundary, um, is if we have a, so if we have just, just the boundary space-time, t and x, let's say, if we have, if, C, if we have some region A um, on the boundary, 
by saying I have control over the physics uh, inside this region A, I know the boundary Hamiltonian, I can evolve inside the domain of dependence on the boundary metric. So really what I have access to is the full, what I, I denote this domain of dependence as D sub, this boundary symbol um, of A. Okay, so this just means that this set, the domain of dependence is defined just on the boundary, in the boundary metric, because we'll be dealing with bulk domains of dependence, which I'll leave undecorated. Okay, so if I know physics in A, it means I know physics in the full do domain of dependence of A. Okay, so the question becomes, and so really rho A is something that is telling us about this entire region and not nothing outside. Yeah, I don't have control over what's happening at this point because I have traced over it. And so that means that at this point, there could be some signal propagating here and so forth. So I can't say anything about the physics outside of the domain of dependence. Okay, so the translation to the question of the bulk is, what is the natural region in the bulk that's associated with this boundary domain of dependence? Well, we want something that's not too small, like only that domain of dependence, because we want some bulk physics. And we want something that's not too large. In particular, it shouldn't, on the boundary, it should really limit to this domain of dependence. So what is a natural bulk region that limits to this boundary domain of dependence? So let's see what a natural region would have been just from causal structure without taking into account of, of the full uh, geometry, and that's something that goes under the name of causal wedge, um, which is, so that's not, that's not, by the way, what will be the dual of A, but it will be a natural region that you might as associate with it, and it's a sort of the, sim the most primitive one, or the most primal one, because after all, it's only using the causal structure and not any more of the geometry. So let me again draw a picture of, like I have drawn there, uh, sort of in a 3D picture with a perspective where I have some constant time slice here. I have my region A. I have its boundary domain of dependence. Okay, this is looking a little bit skewed. <laughs> and now, from the causal point of view, well, you might say, okay, suppose you, you can, you, you're an observer here, you make some excitation, and then you measure what happens here. Well, in, in the bulk, if you send in some signal and it was interacting with the physics, and then there was some measurement you were going to do here, you might imagine that, you know, there should have been some, it, it should know about, say, a causal curve in the bulk that connects these two points. So, if you take, let's say, a future of this point, or future of the whole domain of dependence in the bulk, okay, so that would extend, actually, let me do one more thing. Let me just take, <laughs> take the side view of this. Side view of this would have A somewhere, the domain of dependence having some extent. Okay, now if you, I take the future, it would have extended everywhere in here. So this would be I plus of the boundary domain of dependence of A. That's this entire section. Okay, so that's what can be influenced by what's happening in my region. But out here, that's already too late to learn anything about. On the other hand, the part of the bulk that's cognizant, well, for, that, that can send signals to uh, observer on the boundary is one um, that is in the past. Okay, so this would be the past domain of influence of this boundary domain of dependence. And what we want really is both of them. So this causal wedge, so, that, so, so we want an intersection between the future and the past of, in the bulk, of this boundary domain of dependence. So in fact, that's the definition of it. Let me label causal wedge as C of A. So that's the intersection 
of the future of this boundary domain of dependence of A with the past, past of this boundary domain of dependence of A. Okay, and you can equivalently just replace the full domain of dependence with just its, um, for the future, with just its past, sort of, if you thought of this as your entire space-time, it would be like the past infinity and the future infinity. Here you have, here you can have, it doesn't have to have just a single point. If you have, say, ellipse in a two-dimensional plane, its domain of dependence has a crossover seam like a tent at the top, so this I plus would consist of that whole crossover seam. But nevertheless, that thing, what, that, that future and past of that domain of dependence is sufficient uh, to generate that whole thing. Okay, so that's, that's one quantity. But that quantity doesn't contain enough information. So what does it look like here? It, it would be, look like something like this, where the boundaries of this are generated by null geodesics in the bulk that satisfy the area theorem. Just like black hole generators, horizon generators satisfy the area theorem, it must be that the horizon generators are complete towards the boundary because that's how we define the set. We defined it as a causal set from some boundary region. So those generators have to reach all the way up to the boundary. And, okay, we have some space, spatial surface that's defined maybe as the some analog of A in the bulk that only knows about the, about the, well, that's naturally associated with this region A. Now, we just saw another surface. We saw an extremal surface. And the extremal surface is uh, generically not going to be the same as this wide surface, but it is for special situations. It is in pure ADS when, uh, well, in three dimensions, it's for ADS and BTZ for simply connected regions, and for higher dimensional pure ADS, it's for ball-shaped regions. Basically, when this domain of dependence has, is generated by a single point. Okay, in that, in that case, the two things coincide. Um, but in general, the extremal surface must lie outside of this causal wedge. It must lie outside because its expansion is zero uh, to start with, because it was an extremal surface. This expansion is positive. You can, uh, uh, so, so you can see, well, you can reach a contradiction if you assume that it were inside by comparing expansions. Okay, so I can, again, I can go into more detail, but not uh, in the last five minutes. Um, so, as a dual of the density matrix, the causal wedge wasn't good enough because it didn't contain the geometry that told us where the extremal surface was, but we can compute the entanglement entropy from, from the density matrix, but not, the, not from this HRT prescription because we don't, if we only know the geometry inside the causal wedge. So we need more. And in fact, the natural region is to take the region that goes all the way up to here, so now to the extremal surface, and that's something that's called the entanglement wedge. That you heard a lot about these, these days. So entanglement wedge uh, it's again a codimension zero bulk region, which is purely geometrical, meaning it doesn't have any coordinate dependence. It's fully covariantly well defined in arbitrarily time varying uh, space-time, that asymptotes to ADS. And it's just, if I define my region, you know, R of A as anything that joins A with this, let, let me again call it gamma A, this extremal surface, I can just define the entanglement wedge as the domain, the, bu the, bu the bulk domain of dependence of this homology region R of A. Okay, so that's going to be something that's again generated by null generators that start out with zero expansion. So those null generators start out with zero expansion. If you have generic curvature condition, 
they will have negative expansion and they won't make it all the way to the boundary, which would have been an infinite affine parameter. So they will caustic and hit a crossover seam. And in fact, they will limit to, again, the boundary domain of dependence of A, this guy, right? Because anything that would go, okay, even though this null GOD6 would end up here on the boundary, this point is not in the domain of dependence of this region because I could take a time-like curve uh, in the bulk that avoid, avoids this entire surface. Okay, so, so the boundary domain of dependence is a limiting, is a limit of both this region and this region is, uh, as you go to the boundary. And you can think of this entanglement which equivalently then as the set of sort of space-like separated points, um, separated points from A, sorry, from gamma A, um, but in the direction sort of towards um, the region A. So on the boundary, let me draw the boundary picture. If I have a co-dimension two uh, surface, so if I have just two-dimensional blackboard, that's a point. <laughs> so, so that's my entangling surface. There's a natural partition of that space into four regions. Well, let me just simplify it by writing it as P. There's the future of P. There's the past of P. And there's two space-like separated regions. Uh, so I can specify just directionality which way you go. Uh, similarly, in the bulk, this extremal surface, gamma A, naturally partitions the bulk geometry into four regions. Two of them are analogous to that and limit to that, which are just the future and past of this extremal surface. And then two space-like separated regions, one is this entanglement wedge of A, and the other is entanglement wedge of the complement, if, if the whole thing is pure. Okay, so you can, you can, in the bulk, you have the analogous thing, you have a gamma A, and then you have the partition, let's say A was on this side, into the entanglement wedge of A, the entanglement wedge of A complement, and the future and past of um, the extremal surface. And this uh, object uh, is now believed to be sort of the natural dual uh, of the reduced density matrix in the sense that if you have any more than that, you already have a contradiction in being able to recover it from sort of the A complement, which should, you should not be able to. And if you have less of that, then you wouldn't be able to recover all the entanglement entropies that you should have known. Okay, but then there's a proof from the quantum, or actually several proofs, from sort of the quantum side, from the quantum information side. Okay, so I am almost out of time. Or am I fully out of time? Well, you can have maybe two or three minutes. Two or three minutes. <laughs> Again, this is that, so thankfully I don't know what I was going to, else I was going to say, so I can, I can, uh, well, let me think. Um, well, okay, yeah, one GR exercise, actually the thing that I wanted to build up towards, okay, here is something that's not very much appreciated even by the community working on this. So since this is a GR school, here is where you can have your niche, <laughs> uh, which is you can very easily prove the following. Well, the thing that is known is that the causal wedge is inside the entanglement wedge. Um, in fact, it's distinct from entanglement wedge is its own domain of dependence. Okay, because it was defined as a domain of dependence of something, but the causal wedge is not its own domain of dependence. So it's strictly contained, okay, the, I hope that, so you can take a sort of a slice of this, define the domain of dependence of that slice. That's what I mean by, you know, domain of dependence of that full region. So any slice in that region. Um, okay, so, you know, you, you can generalize this to be basically the set from which you cannot 
avoid hitting a slice of, 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 of this argument. Okay, so the causal wedge is not its own domain of dependence, which means that if you had recovered the physics in causal wedge, you should have better recover at least a little bit more that went all the way up to the, the domain of dependence, but that's still nested within the uh, full entanglement wedge. You can also have a, you also have nesting for, if you vary the region size individually, the, uh, the, the both the entanglement wedges and the causal wedges nest. And you can, from that, extract a bunch of nice uh, properties. So that's, that's sort of one uh, fun observation. But once you sort of uh, analyze these properties and so forth, that allows one to sort of try to get a better insight into, um, well, how is it that the space-time ends up being built up uh, from these from these different, uh, um, you know, parts of the density matrix and so forth. Okay, so now I took the two minutes, so let me let me end here and invite questions. Thank you. Um, can you just explain quickly why the domain of dependence of CA is not the same as CA? Great. Okay. Very good. So both of these uh, things are causal sets, meaning that their boundaries are generated. They're, they're null surfaces. They're generated by null geodesics. And so, how can it be that the null geodesic that's generated by something from here is any different than null geodesic that I go backwards with? So you might say, well, why isn't it that? these things always coincide. And as I said, in pure ADS, they do coincide. The point is that it's the full congruence. And they, the, if you start the geodesics from here, they caustic towards the boundary. And this crossover seam then hits the boundary. It has to continue once it starts. Once the caustic starts, it, it goes all the way there. On the other hand, the uh, causal wedge, you have defined as a set that you, know, you start your null generators from the boundary. Um, and so they can caustic also, but they caustic towards the bulk. So in fact, this, this white surface need not be smooth. It can be kinked, in which case it would be kinked sort of this way, because this gravity is attractive. So these path-directed null generators converge towards each other. So they, they sort of project to something that's kinked inside. And again, you have a space like uh, crossover seam now towards this direction, towards the bulk. And so that means that when you have a kink like that, um, when you take the domain of dependence of that set, here, that crossover seam was a space-like thing. It was just a restriction of an null surface. And so that, that has to be only space-like. Um, um, or self-intersection of a null surface cannot be time-like, or null, it, it has to be space-like. So the domain of dependence, which is generated by a null generator from here, in fact, part of a null cone, has to lie strictly to the future of this crossover seam, which was already the top boundary of the causal wedge. And so that means, so that's the strict containment. Well, I mean, in general, it's, I mean, it can coincide if there are no caustics, but if there are caustics, then the two really are separated. And then, of course, you have this nesting. Very good. <laughs> uh, so you said that the causal wedge isn't big, like you motivated going to the entanglement wedge by saying the causal wedge isn't big enough to capture everything that you, know, you want on the boundary. Could you expand on that? Um, well, it certainly doesn't include the extremal surface. In fact, if you take extremal surface not anchored on the entangling surface of A, but some subsystem, which you also should know, such a thing would also go out, peak out by continuity. 
typically, typically. Okay. Um, okay, there, there, there's exceptions when you have like hog eisens and, and so forth. But um, so if you if it peaks out, that means that by shrinking uh, the subsystem that you're interested in within the known region, at some point there will be a, a tangent of an extremal surface to a Okay, this is going to get a, okay, let me do a top view. <laughs> so we had, we had the, um, this, this surface that was induced by the causal wedge. We had an extremal surface. Now, if the extremal surface was sort of inside, then, okay, let me do the opposite thing of extra, uh, extending the region such that there would be some larger extremal surface um, that's tangent at some point tangent to this um, to this other one. This one has a zero expansion. This one has positive expansion because it's like the black hole horizon. Um, but that's a contradiction because this is tangent, so the the, the expansion um, is in this direction. And this one, okay, that's converging more, has to have smaller expansion than the one that is outside when, when they're at the, at the tangent point. Okay, there's a better way to say it in the full, you know, space-time sense. You say which one is to the past and which one is to the future, but I think this projection of the null generators of these surfaces is intuitive enough. But anyway, the contradiction then is that you would have expected that the expansion here for this surface would have been less than the expansion of the extremal surface, but, but then it would have caustic and never be the generator of the causal wedge. And so that means that the extremal surface has to be outside of the causal wedge, but we know that we can calculate the entanglement entropy from uh, the knowledge of the reduced density matrix, and therefore it's a quantity which if we calculate by this extremal surface area seems to be calculable in the boundary, but not in the bulk if the bulk is, if we're keeping less of the bulk. <laughs> well, I'll still be here in the afternoon, so. Okay, so. Wait a minute, we'll bring everyone here so that we can. I should stay? Yes, of course. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, okay so this is the end of the, of the lecture. Thanks, Veronica. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for your wonderful questions. And, and also, thanks to the Organizers, I guess I can already start thanking the organizers for. <laughs>